was uh, Peter Somerlad and his lightning talk bribed people to go to his session at this time uh, by offering them chocolate. So, Kevin, what are you offering? And I said, I'm offering you meaning. <laughs> okay, it's just like way, way deeper. Um, and honestly, for those of you who enjoyed yourselves perhaps a little too much at last night's event, this is what you want on a Saturday morning. Uh, we are going to continue a quest for meaning. Um, and I'm going to, we're going we're to go a few places. Um, we're going to go to uh, a little bit, that's going to be a bit of philosophy, a bit of logic, a bit of linguistics. Um, oh, there might even be a bit of code. Um, there's, there's all kinds of stuff here. And uh, some human biology, um, uh, as well as um, deep, profound observations. So first of all, what we do in software development is this, ultimately this quest and structuring of meaning. But most of the time, it ends up perhaps a little different. Um, and the problem with meaning is one that I'm, I'm quite familiar with in the sense that uh, one of my, one of my uh, hobbies is writing short fiction. And so there's this challenge of how do you get, how do you get the story into somebody else's head? So Robert Louis Stevenson, um, made the observation, the difficulty of literature is not to write, although that can be a bit of a challenge, but to write what you mean. This is the first challenge. What do you mean? Not to affect your reader, but to affect him precisely as you wish. What you're trying to do is put something into somebody else's head, which is kind of like, okay, that's kind of challenging uh, in the absence of telepathy, although it, it has to be said that I'm sure if the human race... Um, actually did acquire the ability uh, to uh, read other people's minds. You know, we had telepathy. I think that the human race would come to a very rapid and abrupt end. I can't imagine that we would survive very long. Um, but there are also some very interesting things. It's that meaning is not a fixed thing. We can actually see this. Um, so Robert Louis Stevenson, uh, the author of Treasure Island, uh, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, uh, 19th century Scottish author. And we can see that some words have already changed with time. Truth of intercourse is the title of this piece. And it's just like, perhaps the word intercourse has shifted its meaning. Um, I'll for we can forgive him the 19th century use of a gendered pronoun, um, but the point there is, I think that's going to get you into more trouble than that, honestly. So, here's this interesting one. This is a, this is a lovely paper, I'm going to come back to it later, by Maya Lehman, 1980. Um, Programs, Life Cycles, and Laws of Software Evolution. Uh, any program is a model of a model within a theory of a model of an abstraction of some portion of the world or of some universe of discourse. I love this. There it is. In the middle of this academic paper, it's just like, oh, he must have had fun with that sentence. You know? And this is also, this is also now your response when, you're, when your relatives ask you things. So what exactly is it that you do? <laughs> yeah. And no, I'm not fixing your computer. You know, it's... Uh, but this word abstraction is an, in, it's, it's an interesting little one. Um, Dijkstra, in the ironically named humble programmer, I say ironically named because, uh, as, as somebody once observed, uh, the, uh, the unit of ego is measured in nano Dijkstra's, which gives you a sense of the calibration. Um, the purpose of abstraction is not to be vague. This, this is really important because sometimes when people use the word abstract, they think you're being kind of fluffy. And uh, the danger is in some organizations, it's like, oh, oh, the software architect's going to come over here and talk, you know, they're going to be all, all abstract. And it's like, no, 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 no. The purpose, you can get it wrong, there's good abstraction and poor abstraction, but to create a new semantic level in which one can be absolutely precise. And this is quite important because what, what the term abstraction means, we use it all over the place um, abstract, abstraction, abstracting, um, but we don't often rest on what it actually means. Whenever I ask people what, what is abstraction? And I run a number of workshops and courses. So this is a question that comes up uh, quite a lot, and I have a few answers from people. And people normally talk about the purpose of it. That's not what it is. Or rather, it's part of what it is, but it's not all of what it is. And people tell me about the good stuff. But actually, without the good stuff or the bad stuff, abstraction is simply the removal of stuff. Yeah, it's... it's um, from the Latin abstrahere, to draw off, quite literally draw off water. It is the removal. And that makes a lot more sense when you, look, uh, when you, when you marry it with this. You are trying to find, you're trying to remove the stuff 
to find something you can be absolutely precise about, get rid of the noise, find the meaning. Now, we have a bit of a problem with meaning, though. Um, and that's not we as developers, that's we as human beings. Uh, and of course, I need to make the standard observation. Human beings, developers, developers are human beings. I know, discoveries of the 21st century, still exciting. You know, Event horizon telescope, gravitational waves, developers are human beings. Bang, that's your three. So there is this idea that we, um, we struggle with this, and we end up with conversations. You've undoubtedly heard this or used this in a discussion, and it could be on absolutely anything. It could have been on code. It could have been on politics, um, where somebody at some point, yourself included, I'm sure I've used this one, oh, that's just semantics. Uh, it's just, uh, oh, it's just meaning. Oh, well, that's okay then, because obviously that solves it. I mean, what else is there? When we're talking about this, what, what exactly is it that you think you do, particularly when we are talking about this stuff, software? There really is only an understanding of meaning. It's, it's, it's so soft, you know, it's, it's, it's called soft, or, you know, I mean, the other word for it is unkickable wear, um, but that doesn't quite roll off the tongue the same way. So here's the point, is when you're creating a software system, you're creating a system of meaning. And this applies both within the code and without the code. Within the code, your constructs, your choices, they are to do with meaning. They are to do with the way that you are trying to impose some meaning on an utterly arbitrary set, of, a potentially arbitrary set of decisions. From the outside, the software is given meaning by the way that people use it with respect to themselves, their businesses, and so on. And it has meaning that is, is, is far deeper than you can anticipate. It turns out that we're not very good at influencing that. But the bit that we can influence directly is the code. Now, when we talk about code, there's, a little, there's kind of a little um, narrowing that occurs. The narrowing that occurs is when you talk to people about code, then whatever is the top of their current languages list is what they consider to be code. So if you talk to a C++ developer, you see it's even there, C++ developer. Honestly, if you're a C++ developer, stop. That's not career advice. Um, <laughs> it's the point of, is why are you not also a Python developer and an HTML developer and a config file developer? In other words, all of these, all of these, and the list keeps on going down, these are all code. They are all code. There's not the thing that appears in the center of your IDE that you put first on your CV. That's not the only code. If you take away all the other stuff that is coded forms, you do not have a system. Okay, so there's a, there's a notion that this is a really large set of stuff. When I say code, I mean all of that stuff, not just the Turing complete stuff, not just the thing in your favorite language. And there's a little wordplay we can do, which is, turns out to be surprisingly useful, because a lot of people have different ways of approaching what do we mean by code. What is the purpose of code? What is the role of code? Um, the idea that it is there to instruct the machine is kind of sweet and only out of date by, you know, a few decades. Um, what you're actually doing is you're codifying knowledge. And this explains far more about software development than most of the other ways that people talk about this. Um, it is codified knowledge. You are trying to communicate, instruct, you're trying to structure, Communicate, organize. This is what we mean, and this is how it's going to work. All I'm doing is I'm codifying knowledge of the problem domain. I'm codifying knowledge of the solution domain, the technical solutions. I'm bringing together a system of knowledge. Okay? This is the libraries I'm using. This is my knowledge of the language. This is how I work with the tools and the people around me. This is what I know about the existing system. It's, it's a marriage of knowledge. Now, this kind of disturbs a few people, because what they realize and they say, wait a minute, you're saying that that steaming pile of <laughs> legacy is our codified knowledge? Yes. <laughs> and we go, oh, wow, we're a mess. And it's just like mentally, it's just, yeah, human beings can hold multiple contradictory statements uh, simultaneous, uh, simultaneously in their head. And this is a problem because what you find, this also tells you about the quality of a system. If I go into a system, and I'm confronted, well, here's something that we thought about last week. This is what we collectively decided. Here's something that somebody else thought about six months ago that curiously seems to be in contradiction with what we've decided last week. And then there's something from somebody I've never met 
from about six years ago. That it's, in other words, what you've got is this mishmash of knowledge. Again, this is very, this is very human. Okay, um, you know, you walk out of this room, and there are people out there who have some really weird beliefs. You know, let's clarify a few things. Yes, the Earth's getting warmer. Yes, it's our fault. Um, yes, carbon dioxide, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Science. Uh, oh, the Earth is not flat, by the way. Um, you know, this kind of stuff. It turns out that out there, there is a, we have the full smear of human belief. That you've got the f leading edge, and then you've got this kind of medieval edge lurking at the back, and all points in between. In this sense, our systems are nothing more than a mirror of the human race, except that we do need to care a little more about them. They are design systems. They don't have to be quite that messy. We have a number of choices. So this is codified knowledge. You can actually think of a software system as being almost an executable Wikipedia. It's a collaborative exercise. We're going to bring together all of these things. This whole idea of instructing the machine, give up, OK? If you wanted to instruct the machine, I refer you to, uh, let me think, my talk last night, my lightning talk last night, where I quoted uh, Andrew Koenig, that if you broke no compromise in programming languages, you either need to code in Lambda calculus uh, or machine code. And the point is, if you want to program the machine, get down there. And I'm talking firmware, not that fluffy, high-level assembler stuff. OK, you've got, to get, you've got to get in there. So you have a choice here. You have a number of choices. This is overwhelming. This tells us about our paradigms. Our paradigms are systems of codification. Now, what this means is that the main bottleneck and the main axis of software development is defined as a process of knowledge acquisition. You are acquiring knowledge. Sometimes it's the technical stuff. Sometimes it's about the people around you, the organization, the requirements. What do we mean when we say the requirements? What is this system? Um, so knowledge acquisition. Uh, it's pretty good. This is, this is how we kind of characterize it. So if you're looking for what does a software development process look like, then what does a knowledge acquisition process look like? And by the way, again, these are useful phrases. Feel free to include them in any um, presentation uh, when, you're, when you're trying to speak to the higher-ups, when people say, so uh, tell us about your development process. Ah, we're structuring our development process around a synergistic leveraging of knowledge acquisition. Outstanding, excellent. Um, <laughs> Actually, what we're doing is we're learning. Learning sounds so much more simple, but learning is cumulative, it's revisionist. In other words, it's incremental, it's iterative, not necessarily over fixed intervals, but there is this idea that as you learn things, you revise your previous views, your previous understanding. It is also cumulative. Um, sometimes people get the feeling that they know less after developing for a while um, than, uh, uh, you know, and I say, no, your knowledge always increases. It's just your appreciation of what you don't know increases, okay? Um, and there is this point, obviously, that there's the, here's all the things that I know, here's all the things that I believe there are to know. Um, there is a peak moment there where the two touch. It's called adolescence. <laughs> And then after that point, we end up with the inflationary phase where your realization, although what you know keeps increasing, your realization of what you don't know expands faster. Um, which actually leads some interesting challenges when it comes to communication and the notion of an event horizon of the universe, but I'll leave that for another talk. What we're talking about here then is how do I get knowledge around? How do I get this stuff around? It's communication. Now, there's many forms of communication. When we normally talk about communication, um, there is this idea of face-to-face. -face. That's part of it. But we're going to see that there's a little bit more to it than that. Actually, conveying these ideas uh, it can be quite challenging. It also means that it, we have this rather interesting case that most software development, unlike writing, let's say, and I talked about writing earlier on, is done in teams. It is done across multiple people, which is why the whole communication thing turns out to be quite important, because it is a collaborative exercise of group knowledge and knowledge acquisition. It turns out that if you end up with a team where each person knows stuff, but you haven't collaborated, then that's actually not really a team. Uh, you have a problem of group knowledge. Your group knowledge is actually surprisingly small. Your collective knowledge is surprisingly small in that sense. Um, your individual knowledge may be high, but it is distinct and disconnected. It also turns out that getting a bunch of people together to work on something is, well, it involves humans. And they're messy. And they don't always agree on stuff. And social negotiation. It turns out that most of, most of the debates that people have, whether we are talking about brace alignment, um, spaces and tabs, you know, the, the great religious issues of our time. Uh, 
These are social negotiation. When we talk about coding conventions, when we talk about architectural guidelines, these are social negotiation. They are not about correctness. They are about social negotiation, because it turns out there are many things that satisfy the same ultimate desires. And we may have preferences for one, but that's not the same. You're trying to actually negotiate this. Now, this gives us a really interesting insight, again, as to what a code base is. And the structuring of a code base, it becomes a model of participation. And a reminder that code base is also the test code, the scripts, et cetera, et cetera. It's a model of participation. What you're doing with a large system is you're saying, this is how it is built and how you are invited or you know, told to get lost um, in terms of the uh, structure of it. You know, this is another way of saying software architecture. But it turns out software architecture is a way of organizing how people communicate and circulate. A building is not simply, if we're going to use the metaphor, we should understand it. An architecture is not simply a structure. It is a creation of how people um, flow and how people interact uh, within a space. Um, so before dismissing metaphors, it always helps to understand them. I found that most people don't understand what building architecture is. And, that doesn't surprise me. Um, it's not the kind of thing we normally spend our time worrying about. It's us. We normally flow through it. But this idea that we have a number of choices is really important. Software architecture is a matter of design. Now, we're going to talk a little bit about signs later. As this word is presented, design, it looks like we're trying to remove signs and symbolism. But actually, it comes from the Latin designare. It means to designate. You're trying to designate something. You're trying to create something. So this is what this is. This is what this means. And this leads us to the interesting question. How does one do this stuff? And synthesis, which means put things together, is most often correlated with the idea of design. But there's another bit, analysis, which is the taking apart. Now, what is the sequencing for this? And this is kind of an interesting one, because People have struggled. They say, well, you need to analyze something. And then you can synthesize something. And then they kind of reach a full stop. They've run out of sentence. And it's just like, no, 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 that's not how this works. You kind of do that. It kind of turns out you need to be going between the two. Now, there's some really interesting observations and accidental observations we can make about things. Uh, so a number of years ago, I, uh, I, did, uh, I, I used to do uh, tuition. Um, and I, uh, I, I taught people doing computing at school, computing at university, um, the undergraduate degrees, master's degrees, and so on. Some really interesting people you get to meet. But one of, one of the student moments that I remember vividly was uh, a student trying to understand why she got such a low mark in an essay that was on development process. And, and it was to describe the kind of sequential life cycle, the waterfall life cycle. And what she had written is she said, right, first of all, what you do is you implement the system. Then you analyze what went wrong. And then you design it so it's going to do it right. And I said, there is such truth in this. <laughs> such truth. But that is, not what the, that is not what the person who asked the question was after. Uh, you know, you have actually hit upon something very deep and profound, but that's not what's going on here. <laughs> So if you want to do this stuff, you need to kind of look at something else. If we, if we understand that a system a system's built by people that are constantly changed, the, they start resembling aspects of the people, the social structure and so on. Um, but we should look to understand, if we want to understand the relationship between synthesis and analysis, then perhaps let's look at the nature of life and the structure of life. Um, systole, diastole, this is the contraction uh, of the muscles in your heart to push blood out. And diastole is um, your heart expands, the cavities expand to draw blood in. This is the stuff of life. And this is really quite important because it tells us a little bit more about the nature of learning. Learning is not a simple linear process. There is this kind of notion of revisit, recontemplate, um, be shown a different point of view, all of these things. And your knowledge changes with time. And Hemingway observed that the only kind of writing is rewriting. 
Um, and uh, there is a great deal of truth to that. And this idea that, so it's always kind of shocking that refactoring as, a, as a, an acknowledged practice only came really kind of hit the radar about 20 years ago. Um, Martin Fowler's book, uh, first edition of refactoring, was published in 1999. The original research was um, around 10 years before that. Um, so it, there's this idea that we, we're a little bit slow, a little bit late to the game. Now, I have, a, I have this interest, as I say, in writing, and I'm kind of fascinated by um, different styles of writing. I'm, I have no desire to do any screenwriting. This is this book by Robert McKee, Story. And he talks about screenwriting. Um, it's a little formulaic in a couple of places, but there's some really deep stuff, and really good stuff in here. Uh, and he makes this observation, which I thought was absolutely fascinating. If a plot works out exactly as you first planned, you're not working loosely enough to give room to your imagination and instincts. I think this is really interesting, because what he's saying is you kind of, sometimes we're very, so very tight and formal about stuff, and we, we use our metaphors poorly. We talk about people as if they were resources. Um, we talk about the idea of creating software um, as if it were manufacturing, and we talk about pro, you know, cold words like productivity. I have no idea what that means for a human being, except when you break human beings down into their constituent chemicals, which some of you did last night, I can see. Um, so. The, the point here is that I, I like this idea is that if you really want to understand something, you should expect, there's the idea of like, yeah, have a plan, but the trick is planning. It's a, it's a continuous thing. Have a plan and expect to know more. Expect a little bit of surprise, okay? Expect to find something new that may be confounding or it may be absolutely brilliant. But there's this idea that there's almost a disappointment <laughs> What if, it did, what if it, everything did go to plan? How disappointing. You learnt nothing. You knew everything to start with. Which, I mean, maybe, that's, that, maybe that massages your ego in just the right way. But there's a question here. So, um, one of the things I quite like doing is picking up words, language, stuff like that. I run a page on Facebook, Word Friday. Uh, occasionally, I put up on a Friday um, definitions. Um, so, uh, this is a, this wonderful term, panzer. It's from the writing community. And a lot of people look at that, panzer. Is he talking about panthers? Is he talking about tanks? Is he, you know, is he, uh, Sancho panzer? No. You know, the, the people wonder about it. It's like a writer who writes by the seat of their pants. <laughs> okay, in other words, you know, it's, this is actually, there's a wonderful quote from Louis, uh, Louis Limor, and his daughter one day asked him, he's using a typewriter, so for those of you who are perhaps a little young. A typewriter is like a computer connected to a printer, but without the screen. Yeah, is that? OK, fine. Um, uh, oh, yeah, you're streaming characters. Sorry, let's, let's update the vocabulary. Yeah, it's like where you do a hardware stream. OK, it's just like, there we go. So um, and he said, yeah, he's, he's racing along. And his daughter asked him, why are you typing so fast? I said, well, I want to find out what happens. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, that's pantsing, okay? That's what a pantser is. This is in contrast to a plotter, somebody who plots everything to the nth degree. Now, it's very easy to look at this as some kind of like binary thing, but it's not. It's a spectrum. Um, you know, uh, writers lie along this spectrum uh, and even embrace opposing ends depending on the genre uh, that they're in. But the same, is, the same is true of almost any creative activity. Now, this also brings us to the rather interesting question of meaning. So we have this word pants. The point is that this word means different things to different people in this room. It has default meanings and assumptions, OK? So um, there's this notion of, yeah, this can lead to some exciting confusion, uh, transatlantic confusion at times. Um, uh, I'm confessing to nothing. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, you get other ones, the, the Australian English. I mean, <laughs> They're very liberal with their, uh, yeah, oh, the weather's great, so uh, bring your thongs. <laughs> okay, you've been, you've been, yeah, okay, I'm, you, I'm, you, I'm, not, I'm not admitting to anything, but that's kind of fresh. I'll bring my flip-flops instead. Um, what's the problem here? The problem here is language. It's language, and the, the point is we use the term language all over the place. There are many different things that qualify as language. There's programming language. And we say, oh, comfortable. It's, it's got fixed meaning. It's got fixed interpretation. There's semantics that we can define in various different ways. But we do all of this through natural language. And natural language is a bit messy. 
So when we come to the hard stuff, we go in at it with, we use natural language to define these things. And what's funny is whenever people use a formalism, there's always associated natural language text. People are, you know, so the point there is like, I've done the maths so that you can feel comfortable that we're being formal and you know, proper and all the rest of it, but here's what it means in natural language. So we have stuff like algorithm, which is a noun. A process or a set of rules to be followed in calculations or other problem-solving operations, especially by a computer, and this is good. Um, it's worth contrasting this with, say, a procedure. Uh, there is actually a subtle distinction between them. The main difference is that a procedure can halt or need not halt, but the algorithm always halts and gives you the output. In other words, procedures don't have to terminate, but algorithms do, because an algorithm produces an output. Okay, so th this is kind of a, this is a kind of an important uh, idea. And the word itself, oh, it's, it's had a bit of a journey. Um, that's the modern English. This is the Middle English algorithm. It came from the French algorithm, which came from the Latin algorithmus, um, which came from. Uh, well, this is the Arabic. Um, the uh, the native of Khorizm. Um, uh, or the person of charisma. Uh, this is the last name or the nickname of the author uh, of the book on algebra. Um, and algebra is kind of an interesting word because we've kind of almost encountered it in the terms of uh, synthesis. It's the putting together of things. Specifically, algebra is often uh, the setting of bones. There's a lovely metaphor for algebra, the setting of bones to mend the broken things, uh, the things that have come apart. Um, but again, we have a meaning problem because... Um, uh, this guy, he, um, so the, the guy's uh, Abu Jafar Mohammed Ben Musa al Um It's often written in Arabic, except that he was actually from, technically from Persia, uh, and technically from the part of Persia that we now call Kazakhstan. So we have this interesting thing when we try to use a modern concept, which is that of nationality and nation states, um, and try and project it back in time. Again, what is the meaning of that? To say that somebody is from Kazakhstan, but is Persian, but is also Arabic, is, and it, it's, it's an interesting one, because that doesn't quite mesh together from our point of view. We're trying to ha create an anchor. It turns out that language and meaning move. So let's get back to uh, you know, this rather interestingly challenging word. Um, and now I'm going to put a couple of angle brackets on the outside here. <laughs> now, what is interesting is that for another of you, it's just like, oh, okay, I know what he's meaning. If there's a few of you in the audience going, like, I have no idea why that's important, and the rest of you, I didn't even need to put the hash include um, at the end. And it's just like, suddenly I've already, just by moving a couple of symbols, I've already put you somewhere else. It turns out that these subtle cues are profoundly important. This is how humans do stuff. Um, so I'm going to pick on, the, I'm going to go into the algorithm header, um, put on my safari hat, and... Uh, Let's go and have a look at uh, stood sort, because um, honestly, sort is, you know, sort and stack. I, you can do the whole of computer science and that. Um, uh, so uh, what does it mean? How, how are we going to define this? And people say, oh, great, a bit that I can understand. Without the vagaries of language, we shall use logic. We shall be logical and positivist about this. We shall reduce this with logic. It's one of the books I learned logic from. Um, people just don't use typefaces like that anymore. <laughs> you know, they just, you know, I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but it's very evocative of its era. Um, and so, how are we going to actually define the nature of sort? So, here's a little paper. Let's go back to the 1960s. Uh, an axiomatic basis for computer program, Tony Hall. And um, he gave us a couple of ideas, um, one of which is this very simple way of defining um, the meaning, or basically the semantics of Q. Um, a statement or part of a program or program um, in terms of two logical statements about um, the state uh, of the program before and after. And he says, if the assertion P is true before initiation program Q, then the assertion R will be true on its completion. In other words, that's a precondition and postcondition. Um, so this is kind of uh, important. These days we tend to write it this way. Um, it turns out that that syntax was compatible with Pascal's um, uh, commenting conventions, so you can quite happily um, put your statements in between and your, your curly brackets captured um, uh, comments that were, you, know, uh, you could put something formal in and that people would then promptly ignore, because um, that's what people do with comments. Um, so let's have a go at trying to formalize um, 
sort in terms of preconditions and postconditions. And uh, so, you know, I'm going to do the C++ standard library uh, sort. Um, I'm going to leave the whole question of the type and the concepts of iterator. Concepts are just predicates on types. Types are just predicates on values. So it's all predicates all the way down. Um, and types are about uh, type correctness is about binding time. Um, perhaps you bind, perhaps you demonstrate the correctness of a type system, or the incorrectness at um, uh, compile time, or you uh, leave that until runtime uh, or some point beyond. That, that's a separate issue. Very interesting. It's part of the contract of something where you want to use the term contract. It's an agreement. Uh, it just happens to be an enforcement that occurs at a different point. The bit I'm interested in is really what can we say about sort now? It's very tempting to okay, post condition. Most people go in and they say, right, here we go. We've got a range, begin to end. And importantly, notice there's also subtle conventions, meaning of conventions. So a begin end, the end iterator is not the end. It's one of those, one of those ridiculous um, things that you end up saying, oh, yes, that thing that I said was that thing. It's not that thing. This is the end. No, it isn't. It's past the end. Um, so, uh, but that's too much of a word, so we'll just say begin end. But just do not let a C++ programmer help you park your car, okay? <laughs> yeah, 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 back up, you've got plenty of space, bang. Yeah, you can stop now. <laughs> no. So the point here is that people immediately say, oh, sort, I know the meaning of sort. It means the resulting range, values in that are sorted. And conveniently enough, um, we have uh, we have a function in the standard library, is sorted. Brilliant. So we can say that. Now, the problem is you've just got distracted by the word sort and is sorted and all the rest of it. It turns out there might be a little bit more to it than that. It turns out there's an and. And the values from the resulting range are a permutation of the original values. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's what I meant. Yeah, but you didn't say it. It turns out that in this case, we didn't say it, and it didn't mean anything. And this is actually a relatively common thing. And in a formal methods workshop that I attended many years ago, I think pretty much everybody in the class got this wrong. Everybody in the room, because you're so focused on how do I express the ordering you know, using mathematical log logic rather than using English words, and you're so focused, you achieve it. It's just like, yes! And then it's just like, yeah, but are they, are they the original values? Oh, damn, just one thing, one thing. And this is important, because sometimes when people shove this into tests, they're in for a bit of a surprise. Okay? And I do know of a case where somebody quite happily asserted this for the sorting algorithm that they had, um, that they had developed. Um, uh, they quite happily asserted this, and the test passed. Magnificent. Sadly, however, it turns out that what they had done carefully and with many loops in a quasi-optimal way was written the first value of the array over the rest. Turns out that is a sorted sequence. It is sorted in non-descending order. And it's, it turns out that actually copying the first element over everything else could have been done far more easily <laughs> if that is what they wanted to achieve. And this is the thing, oh, that's not what I meant. And this is, where we, this is where we find that the nature of this stuff, there you have a simple revision, a simple iteration. Now, we come to the vexed question of, what, is there a precondition? And this one came up in Bjorn's talk yesterday. So I thought, you know, let's just go back to the original paper, which I've noticed that many people who have been involved in the C++ contract stuff, or indeed any of the contract programs, they don't read their literature. It really helps to actually read the original sources. Um, so what did Tony Hall say? If there are no preconditions imposed, we write true before. In other words, precondition, true. It's all good. So let us do that. Yeah, somehow that doesn't seem to quite cut it, though. It's when we put that in there, we realize that that's not really the whole truth, is it? It turns out there's a bit more. Begin and end are valid iterators. Oh, yeah, that helps. And from the same range. And begin does not follow end. I would have said end is reachable by end. What, you mean like that? Yes. <laughs> It's all right, Marshall, I'll pay you afterwards. <laughs> now, is this, here's an interesting one. Is, is that a decidable proposition? No, no. Turns out this is not. I refer you to my talk on the, uh, where we solved the halting problem the other night. Um, uh, turns out this is not a, a with, or rather, within the system of stood sort, this is not decidable. It is actually decidable outside the system of stood sort, but that takes us into girdle space and all kinds of exciting stuff. However, it's too early in the morning for that. Um, 
this is not decidable, and therefore, interestingly enough, if we were to tr attempt to decide this within the context of sort, we would discover that we no longer had an algorithm. This is a procedure. And all kinds of other stuff. Uh, you know, it's just like, uh, yeah. So, fine. This is all good. Um, it's also a comment. So, therefore, it doesn't exist. People don't read it. Um, you know, it, it's, it, it's just not there. So, w w so, we might try and reformulate this um, in uh, uh, C++ is adopted uh, for C++20. Um, there you go. That's it. That's all you can say. Um, so, I, it's one of those reasons I get, I fail to get very excited when people apply logic to stuff, but when they start doing contract stuff, again, you need to read the history and discover it's not quite as useful as you hoped. Um, that's, that's all we get to say, which is a bit disappointing, but that's actually not the main gripe. So, if we've already discovered that logic is not going to fully cut it, and logic mediated through, um, mediated through the uh, entanglement and noise of a programming language gets really messy unless you had everything in there from the start, um, we are not going to solve this problem, but we have another problem. How do I implement this? Because it turns out, what, what, remind me, what header was this in? Algorithm. What is an algorithm? It's a precise specification of steps. The one thing that most of the things inside the C++ algorithms header are not is algorithms. This is one of those, yeah, it's the algorithm header, but it doesn't really contain algorithms. Because an algorithm, quicksort is an algorithm. Exchange sort is an algorithm. Bubble sort is an algorithm. And people start going, oh, he said bubble sort. Yeah, no, honestly, exchange sort has the same problems. Merge, all of these are algorithms. The one thing std sort is not is an algorithm. Categorically, it is not an algorithm. Hmm, so could I implement it like this? There are two reasons I can't. The one reason I'm interested in is to do with what other guarantees are there? When we say sort, what do we mean by sort? And people have a kind of a, when they read this in a certain context, they have an expectation. And so if I set this one up in C11, I've got some values there, 314159. I've got a, an expected result set, um, so I'm not going to fall into the assorted trap. 113459. And then I'm going to sort it, and then I'm going to say I'm going to assert the values equal sorted, and this is all good. But we have another expectation that is not stated here. And that if we're going to say that this is an algorithm, then we're going to be talking about the performance. It's, it's not really an algorithm. So this, this, is, this is where we start talking about. So if I give you something that happens to have Q sort has no guarantees on it. So if I give you something that's like this, bubble sort or exchange sort, you're going to go, oh, that's not what I meant. That's not what I expected. We, uh, this is not, OK, show, show me how you're going to do that. Yeah, this is like, oh, okay, this is a little bit, we, we've got a little bit of meaning that well, we just have to make a promise. But it turns out this also gets us into the discussion of what do we mean by certain things. People often say, when you talk about, so as I said, you can actually see through most things in computer science and computing, you can see through the lens of standard sort, or rather any sort, and stacks. Because it turns out this is a common problem. You ask somebody, what are your performance requirements? They say, oh, we don't have any performance requirements. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I like that. You do, you just don't know it. So what I'm going to offer you here is I'm going to offer you permutation sort. <laughs> if you're not sure how to implement permutation sort, here is a very simple implementation. Permutation sort basically goes through, takes the arrangement of values and just goes through all the possible permutations until it runs out. And in that case, it is sorted. What is the complexity of this? <laughs> if, you, if you offer this to people, they will discover they have performance requirements. <laughs> Okay. This, in other words, you did not know it until it happened. And this is really important because what we're dealing with here is, is the dark matter. The dark matter of software development um, or the dark matter of creation of design things, which is assumption. We have assumptions. But the curious thing about assumptions, they're very strange little beasts. You do not know you have an assumption until it is contradicted. At that moment, you go, oh, I had assumed that. At that moment, you have discovered you have an assumption. Now, this is quite interesting, because it means that the best you can ever do is you can catalog assumptions so far. You can recognize from your own experience, and collectively within a group, we're going to make a number of assumptions here, because you've done this before. You know about assumptions. Okay? But that's the ones you are aware of. And the point is that set will get larger with time. So occasionally, you know, I sort of remember seeing this in the past. Somebody that's absolutely brilliant. It's just like, Project, list of project assumptions. And it's just, oh, that's so sweet. Um, it's just like, no, 
the best you've got is list of known project assumptions so far. To be continued should be at the bottom of the page. Okay? It is an open thing. It's not that you can't discover assumptions. It's just that it's not closed at the point you thought it was closed. So you got that. And if you want to make things a little bit worse, there's BOGO sort. You know, random shuffle until it's sorted, <laughs> which is complexity OMG. Um, <laughs> but again, there's, and so therefore we may say, okay, look, really, th 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 that kind of complexity, th this is too, this is bad, okay? That's not what I went. I, I need something that, you know, is n log n or, or better. Is, is there something better? Well, yeah, it turns out there is. Um, and this was an algorithm to come out of, um, this was uh, an algorithm to come out of 4 possibly the only good thing to ever come out of 4chan. Um, we don't know who did it. It was anonymous. Um, um, they wrote some pretty ropey script. I've tidied it up a bit, um, so it's actually executable in Born Shell, not just Bash. Uh, and Sleep Sort has some very interesting properties. Um, so uh, we can run it. Um, we can go ahead. 314159. One, three, four, five. You've got to wait for it a little bit. And then we get uh, nine. Yeah. That's a really cool algorithm. It's got O-N complexity. Oh, but that's not what I meant. It turns out that you actually meant something else as well when you said that you wanted better performance. In other words, you got drawn into the conversation. When people, when people talk, they narrow, in many cases, the subject. So I just showed you things that were oh horrific. And so therefore, you start fixating on that. And that becomes the focus. So therefore, you focus on that, whilst completely missing this over here. This is the interesting property of humans. We have a concept called focus. And focus, focus is a very useful thing. And we talk a lot about attention management. But focus, by definition, implies that something is not being focused on. And we're very poor at recognizing that. If I'm focusing on this, I'm not focusing on that. Well, we focus on both. Well, that's not focus, is it? Focus on everything. It's just like, no, I get that when I take my contact lenses out. Uh, everything is equally blurry. I have reduced. It's the great leveler. It's just, no. Obviously, nothing is complete without XK, XKCD. Our field has been struggling with this problem for years. Struggle no more. I'm here to solve it with algorithms. Six months later, wow, this problem is really hard. You don't say. We told you it was hard, yeah, but now that I've tried, we know it's hard. <laughs> so what you see is we're talking here a little bit about what is knowable, what is knowability, and decidability, knowability, things that we know, things that we do not know. This is, this is difficult. So this is a rather nice piece by Keith Braithwaite in uh, 97 Things Every Programmer Should Know, Read the Humanities. And we kind of, and he talks about, he, he refers to Wittgenstein. Now, Wittgenstein basically was two people. Uh, there was an early Wittgenstein and a later Wittgenstein. They, they kind of disagreed with themselves. And so when I said uh, earlier on that, you know, you know, software development normally takes, you know, multiple people, sometimes those multiple people may be you. Um, and you can disagree with yourself in the past. There's future me, which is undoubtedly going to disagree with past me. And I'm kind of, I'm the arbiter between the two of them, like steady guys, okay? Um, and Wittgenstein was all, it's all logic. It's all, you know, we can reduce everything to stuff. Later Wittgenstein was yeah, not quite so convinced by this. Um, uh, Wittgenstein makes a very good case that any language we use to speak to one another is not and cannot be a serialization format for getting a thought or idea or picture out of one person's head and into another's, which is a challenge, because when you're writing code, what you're actually trying to do is take a mental model. Here's how I conceive of this. This, is, this informs my vocabulary. This informs my choices. This informs everything about this code, and I'm going to give you that idea. I, this is how I would like you to view this, not si merely as a set of symbols and curly brackets and bits and pieces. There is meaning to this that goes deeper. I'm going to offer you a model, but our bandwidth is severely limited. Wittgenstein also shows that our ability to understand one another at all does not arise from shared definitions. We spend a lot of time talking about definitions, and that certainly has value, but we need to understand it has a boundary. It has a limit. It arises from a shared experience, from a form of life. Hmm, not the first time we've mentioned that. This may be one reason that my programmers who are steeped in their problem domain tend to do better than those who stand apart from it. Often we have this idea of software developers being observers of something rather than being in the something. And this gives you a very different kind of view of the world, the view from the inside versus the view from the outside. They aren't different, mind the gap. Now, there's also something else. When it comes to meaning, we may say, well, OK, let us go to the problem domain. Let us try and immerse ourselves. Let us have conversations. And this is good. 
But again, those have limitations. Everything that we do will have limitations. Okay? This, and, uh, and so we need to recognize that and be kind of at peace with it. You know, it's okay. I'm going to use all of these things that have limitations to build something. Okay? Rather than rely on any one of them, I'm going to go through all of them. So Nate Jackson is one of those... One of those pieces with a great title, your, customer to, your customers do not mean what they say. And he says, I've never met a customer that wasn't all too happy to tell me about what they wanted, usually in great detail. The problem is that customers don't always tell you the whole truth. Ah, oh, truth, it's that truth again. They generally don't lie. Yeah, this is not the issue. When people don't tell you the truth, it's in the, in, in the world of software, it is not because they are lying. Um, it's that they use, they use their context, and turns out context turns out to be quite important. They use their terminology. There's huge amounts of details. They abstract. It turns out we're not the only people who do abstraction. They leave out loads of stuff because they don't think it necessarily helps you understand it, or rather, it's so ingrained in their thinking they don't even see it, okay? And they make assumptions, which we've already learned about. This is compounded by the fact that many customers don't actually know what they want in the first place. And a lot of people will complain about that. Oh, customers are always the problem. Again, I have bad news for you. It turns out that customers are a subset of that group that is called humans. This is a general statement. Okay, you can find this in almost any, any discipline. Uh, a friend of mine became, uh, he did a gap year, and he, uh, he became a, uh, an estate agent um, for, for part of that. And he said, honestly, people have no idea what they want when they're buying a house. You, know, you can get a couple, and they can have apparently had a conversation, and they come in, and they just say, oh, that looks nice, and it's completely outside what they expect, either in terms of price, or features, or location. They have no idea. We haven't even hit the hard stuff. <laughs> yeah. So this is a non-trivial thing. So again, it goes back to this idea that Learning is part of this. You are on a, you are on a journey, to use the metaphor. Okay? You, the whole point is it's, it's an approach. We don't, it's not the answer is here. It is uh, we are working towards it. It is a process. Discreet, CB, nice. But OK, I turned, up, I, turned up, I turned up late to the lightning talks yesterday, off by one error. So you know, that's, that's forgiven. But I have a solution for that, by the way. Um, so let's go back to 1968. We've done 1969. And this whole idea, people say, oh, well, yeah, but the problem is that software engineering told me that I need to plan everything in advance. I've got to learn everything in advance. It's like, yeah, 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 yeah. Again, I wish people would go back and read the sources. We can't read everything. This is true. So this is why we have communities. We can rely on the knowledge that other people, uh, other people require. We should use our collective intelligence. So this is um, 1968, uh, a couple of months before... Um, uh, Felix Petricone did uh, a wonderful lightning talk on uh, Doug Engelbart's uh, Mother of All Demos, which was a couple of months later. 1968 was a hell of a year. Um, this is one of the quotes, one of many, many quotes inside the software engineering proceedings. The design process is an iterative one. You can't blame software engineering. You can blame misunderstandings of software engineering, but the original um, conference that was named software engineering was not the place to blame. They spent a lot of time talking about the fact you can't do this stuff by trying to know everything up front. That ain't going to work. So they're not the people to blame. One of the other interesting things is they, they look at, they, there's a number of things that are referred to. And one of them is um, this book by Christopher Alexander. Um, you kind of see a theme to books that were published a while ago. If they're important, they're going to be in black, and they're going to use some slightly not quite right font, but it's okay. You can get away with it here. Um, a Notes on the Synthesis of Form is one of those book titles that clearly was not a book title that was used aloud. <laughs> because Notes on the Synthesis of Form, just, just, you know, so sometimes people just call it Notes, or Synthesis, or, but Notes most, mostly. And, this is Christopher Alexander who came up with design patterns in the 1970s. But it turns out he, this is published in 1964. Very influential work in the 60s. And I, I came across it in the 90s. Uh, and I don't think I appreciated how influential it was because reading the software engineering proceedings, it turns out it's referred to a couple of times in there. What people are looking at is they're saying, let us understand how he's talked about this stuff. He's not just talking about building architecture. He's talking about how we create things, how we design things. And um, what is fascinating here is that we can see this in relation to systems of meaning. 
We may therefore picture the process of form making as the action of a series of subsystems, all interlinked, yet sufficiently free of one another to adjust independently in a feasible amount of time. This is the attraction um, from the uh, software engineering um, uh, conference was he's talking about subsystems here. He's talking about modularity. He's talking about large systems. How do we create large systems? We break them into parts and loosen the coupling between them. Okay, and so that's quite an interesting one when you look at it. In fact, quite literally, um, the word analysis, given that we got the word synthesis there, means to loosen. Uh, Analusa in, uh, in in Greek, I believe. Um, yes, it is Greek. Um, it, that's what it means. It's to loosen, um, but also it. It implies it works because the cycles of correction, recorrection, there you go, refactoring, learning, um, which occur during adaptation are restricted to one subsystem at a time. So this is kind of, this is old stuff. Um, and it, you know, formally we can sort of define it and draw bubble diagrams. People, people like drawing bubbles and lines back then. These days we use kind of like squares and rectangles. You know, the shapes have changed over the decades. Uh, the midpoint was around the 1980s. I noticed diagrams used what are called bub tangles or round tangles. Uh, they are rectangles with rounded edges. And so if you look at notations through the ages, and yes, I am boring enough to have done that, um, there, is, there, is, there is a kind of an interesting uh, uh, e evolution there. But if this is, if we don't, just think about this as code in a modular sense, in a formal sense, but we think about it as systems of meaning. How do you create a system of meaning that allows learning? Well, you kind of loosen things. You allow it to adjust with itself. It can at times contradict itself. Uh, but be careful how, care but the, the point is, you do, you do need to care about coupling and coupling on, coupling on incidental and accidental details. I always imagine that this was the case, first Roman programmer, Months seven, eight, nine, ten don't have names. What should we call them? Second Roman programmer egging on the first one. I'll oh, just number them. Isn't that bad practice to hard code numbers? Oh, it's fine. They'll never change. Right. September, October, November, December. It is though. If you've ever wondered where those months got their name from, we are we are we are not the only people to lack imagination and do things horribly wrong. Um, it's a case of like, yeah, we'll call them seven, eight, nine, ten. We just had no other names for them. Um, so, yeah, and then we do a, a kind of a, a shift of two. So, we have a problem here. Um, the problem is one of meaning um, uh, and trying to get to meaning. So, how do we, how do we kind of start addressing it? So, in, uh, in POSA 5, one of the things we looked at was a relationship. We talked a bit about meaning, and there was a little part that I, um, I have quite a bit of fun writing. Semiotics is... Um, it's kind of like part of the study of meaning or symbols related to meaning. Defines a sign as a two-part whole. So if we're going to design, perhaps we should understand signs. Two-part whole, a dyad, comprising a signifier and a signified. The signifier is the expression of a sign, it's, maternal, it's material aspect. The signified is the corresponding mental concept engendered by the signifier. Okay, do we have an example? Yes, we do. Dinner. So dinner is an interesting one. Um, because it turns out that two people can be using this word and actually mean something slightly different. Um, as I discovered with an uh, ex-girlfriend 30 years ago, yeah, 30, it's almost 30 years to, uh, uh, to the day, not quite, um, um, that she'd invited me round for dinner on a Sunday. She had some friends coming round. And it's just like, yeah, that's cool. Um, so I rocked up at 6 o'clock thinking I was early. Um, there's nobody there. And she's in a really foul mood, um, and I can't quite work out why. And then eventually I ask, where are your friends? And she said, well, they came about five or six hours ago. We, ate, we waited for you. We ate. They left. Oh, OK. Sunday dinner is different to, right, OK. Sunday dinner is equivalent to Sunday lunch if you're from certain parts of England, apparently. <laughs> I, I'm originally from London, and uh, so uh, quite southern, and uh, uh, she, um, she's from the north. And uh, there is a line running down the middle of the country that defines certain vocabulary distinctions. Um, this one is a, I won't say it was a relationship breaker, but a couple of months later, we weren't together. Um, <laughs> so, you know, we have these little things. We are using the same signifier. And yet, it turns out we're having a different conversation. Yeah? The semantics are quite, quite different. Here's one, here's one, half two. Now, for a number of you in this room, half two, oh yeah, OK. But there's a reasonable number of you going like that. Because <laughs> you're speaking one of the other Germanic languages. Maybe, maybe, maybe it's Dutch, maybe it's Danish, maybe it's Norwegian, maybe it's Swedish, maybe it's German. 
In all of these, it's half before, not half after. It turns out that, you know, the simple translation does not quite work. You can be off by an hour, you know? It's, uh, so this, this turns out to be relatively critical. But what is interesting is the influence of context. Because nobody was sitting there thinking that or that. Because of the context we're in now. You may well have been awake at this point, but that's not the context that we're in now. We're in the context of thinking, I'm at the conference, and that has an afternoon. So we have a default set of stuff we bring to every conversation, and some of it can be quite subtle. Now, of course, you use certain sets of symbols, and you know, if you happen to be American and I say half two, you go one. <laughs> So, yay arithmetic, but, you know, um, again, context of evaluation turns out to have a huge, huge distinction. But, you know, honestly, um, to those speaking US English, I'm just going to clarify, quarter of four is one. So, um, so we have these words and how they drift and how one community can use them in a particular way and not realize its implications. So a, a term that I find is used extensively, and we, we have Kent Beck to blame for this. He, he used the term velocity uh, originally. A lot of people think this is a scrum term. Uh, it's, it, it's, it's not. Um, scrum is like English. Um, it's, it's kind of borrowed from everywhere, or stolen from everywhere. Borrowed is such a gentle word. No, again, these words have meaning, stolen from everywhere. And so people often talk about development velocity, and they talk about their team velocity, and they measure their velocity in very abstract units sometimes. Um, and if people focused on velocity, I think that would be a fine thing. But they don't, because what they're actually talking about is speed, which turns out not to be the same. And it turns out that we're going to be very formal, although in casual parlance, velocity and speed may be interchangeable. If we're going to be formal about this, and we're going to try and define something, I don't know, if we're going to talk about something like software development, then perhaps we should care about the difference between um, uh, velocity and speed. Um, because it turns out that it, it's a vector quantity, which means it has direction. Direction matters. And a lot of people are utterly obsessed. This is the blind spot. It's like, right, we need to be developing faster. <laughs> Honestly, you need to be going in the right direction. <laughs> the speed becomes a secondary issue. I have experienced this when driving around the ring road system outside, um, uh, outside Brussels, trying to get to Germany. Uh, in, in the era before I had, uh, the year before Google Maps, and, the, and I didn't have a sat nav with me, I used um, uh, Microsoft Autoroute, if anybody remembers that. Um, and Autoroute, again, assumptions, these naive assumptions about how we view the world based on our, our experience. And so, you know, uh, well done to those in Redmond who realize that there's more than one language in the world. So that was good. Um, uh, but it turns out that they had made a, 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 an outstandingly uh, erroneous assumption that there were only two languages they needed to worry about uh, when uh, dealing with Autoroute. In other words, the language of deployment, which in my case is going to be English, uh, UK, um, and then there is the language of the target. Okay, so if I'm driving in Germany, then I'm expecting the German names so I can recognize them. Okay, it's no good to see me, yeah, Munich, yeah, but München, I need to see that so I can just be sure about that. That's fine. The problem is, what is the language for Belgium? <laughs> you know, this is the stuff of, uh, of wars and all the rest of it, you know. Um, so the point here is that there is the idea of we have one place for another language. That's not how the world works. And, we, and, and so therefore, you have this. And so therefore, I am busy driving round the ring road in the Flemish part in Flanders with a bunch of names that are printed assuming that French is the default language. And they don't use, they don't, except in the, in the Brussels region, they don't use two languages. And so I'm guessing at half the place names because they're French, but actually the place names on the signs are, are not in French. They're in Dutch, and I'm guessing, and eventually I realize I'm going the wrong way. How do I realize I'm going the wrong way? Because the sun is in exactly the wrong part of the sky. <laughs> it turns out I was going at speed in the wrong direction. The right direction matters, and people are obsessed with this. And of course, we, there is a relationship between these things, and then there's a subtle relationship, and it turns out people say, well, you know, there's this, and you know, it's, it's, uh, you know, it's with respect to time, and people do stuff like that, and go, oh, that looks a bit technical and complex. Um, though it does help us. And then people say, well, let's just keep it simple. Let's just imagine we're moving at constant speed, 
and we can do this. Now, this matters to us in software because um, S, what does S mean? Um, T is time, S means stuff. <laughs> you you st just stop me if I'm getting too technical for you, okay? <laughs> S means stuff. It's the amount of stuff we're getting per time. And maybe V is value, okay? Uh, and, and this is a very simplistic view of, of, of how things are. But again, what we've done is we've accidentally reduced something that is quite complex, um, how are we learning, how are we able, what, what is it that we are doing right, what is it that we need to um, make right, um, and how are we going to get better at this, our codification knowledge, how are we as a team, all of these questions have just been reduced to some measure of stuff. There's a lot that is not being said. Now, of course, it turns out that you can say an awful lot with absence of something. Um, and Kate Gregory's talk uh, the other day uh, on uh, what do we mean when we say nothing is, 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 uh, uh, is, uh, is quite important. There's a self-referentiality sometimes, and that indeed nothingness turns out to be important, but sometimes it's knowing what does it mean? It sometimes has meaning. So this is a blank screen. But the, we now sometimes get the problem of when we try to define things, it changes the very thing we're trying to define. So if I label this as blank, it is no longer blank. Yeah. Um, and then we look at the, the origin of the word. It's from the French, blanc, which is this. So, <laughs> so I love the fact that blank screens are normally black. In fact, that was an interesting one. How to unnerve the, uh, uh, the AV people is I had, um, you know, we'd spent a bit of time at the beginning of the talk uh, trying to set things up and make sure that everything was coming through. What's my first screen? It's black. So it's just like, whoa, whoa, I thought we fixed that problem. It's like, no, we, we're good. So I can have a blank red screen. Now, it turns out the red is an interesting color because it has meaning. Most colors have some kind of associated meaning, but it's a subtle meaning. And when people say, oh, we define things through words or we define things through symbols, that's not entirely true. It turns out there's a whole range of stuff. It turns out color has meaning. We teach kids, you know, red means stop, green means go. That's what they mean. We actually even use those words. Um, and we can subvert meaning as well. The red man, do not cross him. But sign, that's one of the things in Bristol we do, we, we do street art in Bristol. Bristol is, a, is, is great for street art, but it is also great for subversion of signs. Um, and, uh, you know, the red man has meaning. Um, okay, you see that, and apparently, uh, apparently they don't understand this in the U.S., which is why you go into the U.S. and every every street sign is an essay. <laughs> every street sign you see, I've never read so much. It's like, how do you make sure that people do not exceed the speed limit? You put loads of signage up that's written in words. And so you have to slow down to read it. It's just that <laughs> that's that's quite clever if that's what was, was the intention. Um, walk, don't walk. Honestly, red man works for me, but don't cross him. And we can, we can subvert things. Signs so easily subverted. Death is coming at any time on footway. <laughs> Notice how the addition of one, word, uh, of one symbol changes the meaning. I mean, it's a lot more exciting. It makes walking way more exciting. <laughs> but this is the other thing, is sometimes we pick up fragments of what we think are the correct requirements or the correct interpretation of a piece of code but we don't realize there's another piece of code, there's another thought, another assumption that actually contradicts it or throws it into a completely different light. So, we're good with red, good with green. These are colors and words that have particular meanings. But we now come to the problem of not only just misunderstanding people when we talk, when we write code, when we write anything, whether it is an email, when we're trying to communicate something, all communication has its limitations. And some of those are because we're starting from a different position. But then we have the problem of like, can that person actually know what it is that I am saying? Sometimes we hit a boundary, a genuine boundary there. So, um, so last year, no, a year before, in 2019 now, last year before, uh, we went to this um, outdoor art installation um, here in Bristol, um, and uh, we turned a corner, and my wife said, she chuckled and said, can you see what that says? What? <laughs> so, uh, I said, oh, I see, They've, I can see a slight discoloration. 
yeah, they've done this. So 90% of the people, 90 to 95% of the people looking at it are having a good chuckle. And there's the rest of us who are red, green, colorblind that are struggling with this. But it's okay. I'm in technology. So I got my phone out, flipped it. It's like, <laughs> yes, this is a solvable problem, okay? But the point there is in order to do this, in order to reach that meaning, and this is important when we talk to people, not just when we're talking about the customer divide, but even within software, we may make assumptions, we may not even see the thing that somebody is pointing out. We may not perceive it until somebody makes a point of it. At that point, I can put effort into it. I can put work into this and actually get a result out. But I have to be made aware of these things. We are often not aware of that which we cannot see and do not know. Then there are other things that just simply won't, you know. So as well as being colorblind, I'm also um, synesthetic. Um, and uh, synesthesia for me manifests itself in terms of numbers. And this is a kind of standard synesthetic test. Um, and somebody who has uh, number grapheme um, uh, uh, synesthesia will naturally pick apart the twos and the fives because they're actually slightly different colors. Um, it's how I remember room numbers when I go to hotels, is they all, they're all color coded, which I think is brilliant and convenient. Um, uh, it's also one of the reasons I often tone down um, syntax highlighting, because it's wrong most of the time. Um, in, fact, they, in fact, this standard one, they chose the wrong colors for these. Uh, it turns out that uh, two is actually green and five is red. And you're thinking, how can that work? Yeah, well, that's in my head, not in my eyes, so I'm good. Um, so, but this point here is that can you make somebody see something that they are not actually wired to see? It becomes very personal. Kandinsky um, uh, is believed to have been synesthetic. Um, and this art has a very particular meaning, which means absolutely nothing to me except that I like it, but it doesn't mean something to me in the same way it meant something to him. So we're now into the realm of subjective experience. We can move between things that are objective, this is a whole spectrum, and understanding the nature of knowledge is a very difficult one because some of it is accessible, some of it is decidable, but not all of it is. Now, we can take stuff like this, and default association, we use the word green. Green often means something very positive, it's to do with uh, the environment and the ecology, and then we say, well, green, yeah, it's the color of nature. That's my black and white view of nature. Um, so, um, so what we've got here is a tree. And of course, we are very familiar with tree structures in software, although sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when I told my kids, oh yeah, in software, you know, you know, in software we call that a tree structure, folders and this stuff like that. But the trees always have the roots at the top, and the leaves have the leaves are at the bottom. When you start saying it to somebody who is not in software development, you start saying, they go like, I sound like an idiot. <laughs> but the kids are looking at you, you're kidding, right? No, no, really, it's, a, you know, it's like our, our tri the roots, are, it's just like, you, <laughs> how do you guys run the planet? You know, it's, <laughs> and clearly th this is not green, but you know, if it, so, you know, so what's this? <laughs> yeah, exactly, see that only works for a certain subset of the population. And I'm very happy that some of that subset is in here. Um, so uh, the, the, what we're messing with here is the thing known as the Stroop effect. And this problem that when we have channels that communicate, the Stroop effect is, is the idea of like, I, I need you to say what the color is on the word. And it turns out that here we have two channels of information. In fact, I think that's purple. I've actually chosen a color I'm not entirely sure about. Um, um, <laughs> Maybe I should just say it's great. The funny thing is, the most green things turn out red for me. So that, that, that yeah. Anyway, yeah. Um, so honestly, it's grey. I, I remember teaching my kids colours, and half the time I was actually asking questions. <laughs> <laughs> and that is that's green, Dad. Okay. You know, it's just that it was one of those things of like, actually, I'm supposed to be teaching you, but okay. Um, so there's an interesting point here. It's also talk, this is also teaches us about how we design systems of meaning and systems of interaction. It's a very simple concept of a system of interaction, um, a toilet cubicle in a public place. Now, this is kind of interesting because it turns out that um, one of the most dysfunctional ways of doing it, this is actually one of those cases where words help. You know, words actually work in this context. If you say engaged or vacant, that works. But you may say, well, yes, but what if I don't speak the language? That's fine, you only need to do one experiment. <laughs> yeah? If you choose a character set or a language that I do not know, I can establish the meaning very, very simply with one test. Ah, that set of symbols, that set of squiggles, means it's engaged. 
if I see another set of squiggles, and I'm going to make an assumption here that it's two-state logic, <laughs> <laughs> then it's the other one. In other words, this is discoverable. And this is also interesting when we talk about systems of meaning. How discoverable is it? On the other hand, one of the dysfunctional ones, so dark and, uh, dark and white, that also works, but red and green, I don't know how those companies are still in business, but they are still in business, producing red and green. So I'm just going there, I have no idea. There's no experiment that I can perform once to find this out. Or well, I can do it once per door. <laughs> That's not very effective. But what is interesting here is when we have multiple channels, so this is actually on the front of the uh, Scrum uh, book. And the, uh, the, the goal here is to actually say what the color is, but you've got an interference. If you read English, there is interference. If you don't read English, there is not interference. So if somebody presents this to me in a language that I have no idea about, then actually I can read off the colors quite easily. So this is an interesting thing, because we've been talking about knowledge, we've been talking about acquiring knowledge, and now I'm saying actually sometimes you can have multiple sources of knowledge and they will interfere. You now know, you know too much. This is, so pat yourself on the back for knowing too much. But this is an important point. The meaning is um, our ability to uh, ascertain the meaning has been confounded. So, and the reason I put the Scrum thing up here is because sometimes uh, there's another thing that people have adopted in Scrum. Uh, they, talked about, they talk about velocity. There's another term that I keep seeing thrown around, which is that of value. And there's a lot of hidden meanings and possibilities in here. And so people sort of say, you know, value, you should work on things that have value. To whom? Well, that's kind of an interesting one. To whom does it have value? Yeah, because the things I value may not be the things that my colleagues value. The things that I value may not be the things that the customer values. Oh, oh, yeah, right. When we said that, Kevin, business value. Okay, so how do we feel about destroying the environment and stuff like that? Um, you know, that, that's a different kind of value. What about my personal growth and learning in, a, in an organization? That's a different kind of value. We're saying something here. Whose business? Oh, yeah. But the question is, what are we saying? We say we're going to prioritize by business value. However, there is a small problem. And people, this has become a mantra. It's a standard mantra. What we're going to do, we have all these requirements. We're going to prioritize them by business value. It sounds like we mean, it sounds like we mean business. It sounds like we know what we're saying. We don't. It turns out that prioritizing by business value is impossible. It is not possible. It is not, this is, this, well, actually it is. You need one of these. And this is how I proposed to go back and fix time yesterday and turn up in time for my talk. Well, I suspect that might be in a parallel universe. Um, so for the rest of you, 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 are, you are fated to, walk th to go through time at approximately one second per second. And that is the only way to reach the future. Because this is a statement about the future. It's not presented as a statement about the future, but it is. There are things here that are not said. It is a hypothetical business value. How can you know the business value of something? By having delivered it and got value for your business. Yeah, but that's a future thing. How are you going to do this without monads? Okay, how, how is this going to work? And without a time, time machine monad, okay, that's next year's lightning talk. Um, how do we do this? You can't know the value. Now, you may be with somebody in a business who's convinced that they know the value. That's great, but conviction and confidence have nothing to do with being right and wrong. I refer you to politics, OK? Um, so the point there is that I, somebody may be utterly, utterly convinced. But you, you need to approach this with a certain amount of humility. Because the, um, what we're actually talking about is estimates. But people, if the, the minute you put that word in there, it changes the whole meaning of the thing. You can only prioritize by estimated business value. You cannot prioritize by business value. You might as well be prioritizing by unicorns, and it'd be way more fun. <laughs> OK? Um, you can only prioritize by estimated business value. An estimate is a probability distribution, which means it distributes. OK? It's got lumps and bits and breadth and stuff like that. It turns out that you can't order things by this shape. OK, it has no natural, you can impose an ordering, but the point is that you may have something that, well, maybe it brings in a little bit, maybe it brings in a lot, but you know, it could go either way, or whereas this one's quite confident. Now, which one is above the other? Well, it isn't, so you have to use another criteria, uh, other criterion to get 
uh, the answer. It's always worth remembering, this is not just a software thing. You know, it's, um, so uh, 2009, uh, one of the highest grossing films of all time was released, uh, Avatar, James Cameron's Avatar, Tall Blue Aliens, um, and uh, uh, Human comes along and kind of saves the world type thing, okay? Uh, 2012, uh, John Carter, tall, not quite blue, aliens, human comes along, saves the world. I might have overreduced both of those plots there. <laughs> um, how much did they cost to make? Both of them cost approximately a quarter of a billion US dollars. How much did they gross uh, in terms of revenue? Well, uh, John Carter kind of got about a tenth of the revenue. So, yeah, Avatar got a lot. John Carter, not so much. Now, you don't think, that the, what do you think? The studio executives are sitting there going like, yeah, this is going to be a completely flop. Yeah, let's back it. No, they were making an estimate based on tall blue aliens. Or off color, maybe they should have made them blue. That, maybe that would have worked. Put them around Alpha Centauri instead of Mars. But the point here is the best you've got is estimate of business value. It changes the language and it changes the meaning fundamentally. It turns it from something linear to something far more complex. It's not a linearizable thing. So when we do these words, we need to understand the consequences. Yes, the planet got destroyed, but for a beautiful moment in time, we create a lot of value for shareholders. So let's be careful with this word value in its naked form. Um, it, is, uh, it has consequences. But this does bring us to something else. And the point here, a lot of it is context. It's the shaping of context and how things are subverted, that we, we may be confident of the meaning of something and conveyed everything that we have understood, but context determines it. And returning to Maya Lehman, he came up with a really interesting system, or a simple way of classifying um, uh, pieces of software. Uh, S programs, P programs, E programs. And an S program is one whose function is formally defined by a derivable from a specification. In other words, if you gave me a specification, I can pretty much tell you, I can candidates for how we're going to implement it and, um, and how we're going to test it. Okay, and I'm fairly confident of that. So that's our friend sort. It's also, bank, uh, it's also most banking software, where we are dealing with uh, banking in the sense of the banking that is governed by rules, as in when I put money here, from here, then there is conservation of money. Okay, there's a whole set of, there is a conservation of money principle that operates here. Okay, transference between accounts, these are, the, all of that stuff is, that's S, that is all S. Okay, um, so there's a lot of stuff that we do that is reducible or is directly um, classified as S. Uh, an S kind of program. This is great. Then we have slightly more interesting ones, the P programs. Despite the fact the problem to be solved can be precisely defined, the acceptability of a solution is determined by the environment in which it is embedded. So notion, notionally here, what we've got is acceptability. I cannot establish the criteria up front, a priori, and even I cannot simply learn and say this is definitively it, because it turns out it becomes a moving target. Now, what is interesting is that this was done in a time before AI, but it actually fits a lot of AI systems because it's doing something. I don't know. Is that the right thing? I have no idea. Let's just say it is. Okay. We determine the acceptability. I can derive the tests for this effectively, but I cannot derive from first principles a test. I have to define what I mean by this is okay. And that's kind of interesting because we get to be on both sides. We get to be on both sides of, of the creation thing. We're actually creating the acceptance criteria. Or some people say something like, it should be okay. Yeah? Yeah, performance should be adequate. Yeah, no, we've had that one. Um, but this is an interesting one because acceptability. We are dealing with uh, potentially approximations um, and uh, we are create there's a, two systems of meaning interacting. What do we mean by acceptance and what do we how do we build the thing? That get slippery, but no more slippery than e-programs. And again, this is an interesting one because a lot of what we now do creates these e-systems. Programs that mechanize a human or societal activity, to be precise, the program has become a part of the world it models. It is embedded in it. Now, back in 1980, Maya Lehman picked a, an example that is quite obvious and visual, um, uh, easy to understand. Uh, he picked an air traffic control system. The output of the air traffic control system goes via a human, communicates, uh, who then communicates with the artifacts that are modeled within the air traffic control system, the planes, and will give them a course of action. 
that communication then changes the ultimately the position of that plane, which then is registered through the system. So therefore, it is now a part of the world. Now, it, it, you used to have to contrive examples a little bit. These days, we don't have to. Social media does it for us. And honestly, it invents stuff as well. You know, alternative facts. We've seen truths in this talk. But this idea that a lot of what we do is now this. The problem is that we think of a lot of things as being like this. You know, we think, oh, it's a tight little algorithm. We, we, we understand how this is supposed to work. And, and, and that's fine, and I can test that. And you know, this is one of my sort of favorite examples of, of this kind of thinking. So, <laughs> it's 2011. Uh, yeah, 2011. The making of a fly, the genetics of animal design. I used this slide once, and there was actually somebody who did a PhD in genetics uh, in the audience. They came up to me and said, yeah, that is a standard text. That, that, so it's a good text, apparently. But you know, I'm going to go for the second-hand price of 35 US dollars rather than the buy new for 1.7 million dollars. It's good, but it's not that good. Um, so we've got an interesting situation here. So this is Amazon as marketplace rather than Amazon as a direct vendor. And we see we've got two vendors here, Profnath and Bordy Book. But honestly, if you're in for 1.7 million, why not go the whole hog and do 2.2, you know? It's just, um, so, so this is the thing. This is, this is what, uh, so th this was the interesting analysis that was done um, over successive days. These are the only two players, <laughs> Prof, Nath, and Bordy Book. Once a day, they update their prices. And it turns out that they have got a fixed ratio. So Profnath is employing a very simple, very simple uh, algorithm. We find the lowest other price out there, and we price ourselves below it. We are going to be, you know, you can't beat us. 99.8% of that other price, OK? We are always the cheapest in the market. They have the book. Board ebook do not have the book. <laughs> What they're doing is they're saying, oh, you want this book? That's fine. You buy it from us, and we sneak over there, buy it, and sell it to you at a 27% or so markup. Genius. How, can I test this? Yes. Each one of those systems is perfect within its own view, its closed system view. And you put them together, and it gets gets to 24 million before somebody pulls the plug. <laughs> now, this, Amazon now has guards against this stuff, I believe. But the point here is how easy is this to create? It is incredibly easy. This is the nature of modern markets. It's the nature of modern systems. We can laugh at that. As you may have noticed, the pound has been experiencing some entertainment the last couple of years. <laughs> And, you know, the, uh, and, uh, oh, yeah, happy non-Brexit day, by the way. Uh, <laughs> um, but there's a thing here. There's a thing here. There was a market. There was a, there was a flash crash. October 2016. And honestly, if you, you know, I was watching the pound kind of, you know, I was watching the pound relatively closely during 2016. And... One of the most fascinating things was during the week, um, you know, the, the only other time, so uh, the um, uh, 24th of June it crashed, um, uh, and, and the weeks after it, it kind of dropped, and then, and then there were some really interesting drops during, the, uh, during one week in September, uh, which happened to be the Conservative Party conference. Every time a politician spoke, the pound went down. It was absolutely fascinating. Uh, Theresa May's just spoken. Wow, that knocked a lot off the pound. Oh my God, Amber Rudd's up. That knocked a lot off the pound. It turns out, like, honestly, just shut up. <laughs> just, just shut up, because it's, it's affecting the pound. But this is after that. And it, even a bunch of Tory, Tory politicians speaking rapidly can't emulate this, um, uh, especially not at half 12. See what I did there? It's not six. Um, so. This takes, this is a speed that humans, this is speed. This is definitely not velocity that we, we've got here. This is, humans can't screw things up this fast. Humans prosthesis, software, that can do it. And this is, this is the problem. We've now got a lot of systems that people have envisaged as S systems. And they said, oh, but we, we put in all the assumptions. No, you have not. 
You have counted for all of the assumptions you have discovered so far. Okay, that is, an, that is unbounded, by the way. Oh, no, 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 we've got everything. Again, confidence, not a substitute for reality. Okay, people used to talk about the, we live in a post-truth era. As we discovered, it's a pre-truth era. The truth has its way. Reality ultimately wins. But this is the things, we're not very good at doing this because we have closed our attention focuses, it narrows as we solve a problem, because that is the nature of human focus and problem solving. This lovely book on actual architecture, has this quote from uh, the Finnish architect, Elil Saarinen, um, always design a thing by considering it in its next larger context. Now, that doesn't mean that you will know the next larger context, but if you don't consider it, you definitely won't be doing the right thing. And when we talk about full stack development, which I have been doing in lightning talks, um, this week, um, I want to switch the meaning here. Development needs to go further than the technical stack. When we talk about the full stack, it doesn't just go down a long way. I mean, honestly, when a lot of people say, I'm a full stack developer, you kind of look at what they're doing and say, you're writing JavaScript that touches the database. That's your full stack? Honestly, I'm pretty sure it goes a long way down. It also goes a long way up. This is the point. The full stack includes the world and the people around the software. It turns out that we, we're not very good with logic and stuff like that. It turns out that it involves other systems which we did not specify and do not understand. And that is not necessarily an intractable problem, or rather, it only really truly becomes a problem when we don't think of it as a problem. If we say that is not a problem, we're guaranteed to have one. If we say we're in a continual state of learning, we need to discover the meaning of this. When you place something in a system, it changes the meaning, the consequences. We often interpret meaning by consequence. That is the one thing that we are very good at seeing. But that. So I want, to talk, I want to close by talking about Michael Jackson. And again, there you go. There's a, a signifier and a completely different signif significant. You're sitting there going like Michael Jackson. My goodness, he did software requirements and specifications as well as Thriller. And it's just like, whoa. Um, uh, and Beer, yes, the, the, uh, the late Beer Hunter, who um, I have one of his books at home. Um, uh, so yes, he managed to reach the uh, age of, what was it? He died at 66, 67. Honestly, if you look at the number of books he published on beer and whiskey, it's perhaps not surprising, but I think he died happy. Um, there's also Sir Michael Jackson, former head of the United Nations Kosovo Forces. And yeah, but I'm not talking about any of them. Um, this is this Michael Jackson. And this is a fascinating book. It's, um, it's a book many people um, pass over. Because, honestly, as titles go, yeah, it's not a killer, is it? <laughs> it's the subtitle that gives you a hint. A Lexicon of Practice, Principles, and Prejudices. Ah, OK, here's stuff I think about. OK, this is quite a good book. It's structured alphabetically. Over 70 little pieces, half a page to three and a half pages, on different things. And, one of the, and he talks very much about how we understand these things. And, he says, the biggest challenge we have is too often we push the problem into the background because we are in a hurry to proceed to a solution. And it's this idea that we, we, are, in a, we are in a hurry. And then people say, oh, yeah, but you know, just talking about this, that's just semantics. That's just like, yeah, it's just meaning. But that's not the conversation stopper. We need to rewrite that because that's what this is all about. It's just meaning, yeah, dot, dot, dot. That's the beginning. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.